release the energy that we can then obtain with a ton of ATP. But again, inside the mitochondria is chapter 10. We're out here in the cytoplasm for chapter 9. They're going to make most of the ATP. And that's what we see in this yet third illustration. Glycolysis, there's our electrons from NADH. But here's our ATP. This is being produced by enzymes as they obtain phosphate groups in the processing of glucose in what is called substrate level phosphorylation. Some of these intermediates of glucose are going to have a phosphate, so enzymes can rip that phosphate off, stick it on ADP, and we've got ATP. And so that substrate is related to enzymes. And so we're going to have a little bit of ATP, a very little bit made in glycolysis. We have a little bit more ATP made in the Krebs cycle. Again, a bunch of enzymes breaking down the glucose into CO2. The production of CO2 happens in the Krebs cycle. But these electrons that are produced in glycolysis and the electrons that are produced in the Krebs cycle, they're going to come to this electron transport chain. And at the very end, we're going to have these electrons flowing back through an enzyme called ATP synthase. And it's going to be the energy gradient of those electrons that's going to drive the production of ATP and we refer to that as oxidative phosphorylation. Now, once we get through the process, it's going to make sense how this is different from this one. But I wanted you to understand the uniqueness that's happening here as we produce. And this is where we're going to produce the bulk of our ATP and recover that energy from glucose. Very little is going to be recovered here in glycolysis. A little bit more here, but the bulk of it. See how they made that a bigger explosion? Most of it is going to be at the very end. So glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm. We are going to produce as a net production per glucose molecule, we are going to produce two NADH molecules. We're going to produce two ATP molecules. And we're going to convert that one molecule of glucose, which is a six-carbon molecule, into two three-carbon molecules called pyruvate. So we start with glucose, we end up with two NADH, two ATP, and two pyruvate. Now the key to understanding glycolysis and the Krebs cycle is follow the carbons. Follow the carbons. That's going to be a big key. Now, the word that you need to be putting on this picture or with, with this description is the three-letter word NET, N-E-T, NET PRODUCTION. When you get a paycheck, that's the important part of the paycheck, right? What does NET PRODUCTION mean? How much you get? What's, what's going into your bank account? What we're going to see is glycolysis actually produces more ATP, but you have to use some during glycolysis. So that's why our net production is only two ATP. The substrate level phosphorylation produces two ATP in glycolysis. Any question, see we're, we're getting more and more detail as we go. Are we good with this sort of more focused picture? Because this is the important part of what comes out of glycolysis. Now, ATP, do we need to talk about ATP very much? No, adenosine triphosphate, we've got our energy stored in our bonds. And when we look at the bonds between phosphate groups, the delta G of our reaction of going from ATP to ADP has a negative delta G naught prime of negative 7.3. What kind of reaction do we have? Exergonic. What's going to be liberated? Heat. Uh, oh, energy. Okay, heat energy. You could look at it like that. Energy is going to be liberated. Is that going to be a spontaneous reaction? Yes. 
Yes, because you're liberating the energy. This is how we can recover the energy for ourselves to use it. And again, we're already putting to use our understanding of what delta G, the Gibbs free energy, really means. Now this is what I want to spend a little bit more time on. Nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. This is referred to as a coenzyme or a cofactor. And when you write NAD, I want you to make sure you put a plus there. Because NAD plus, one plus, for one more electron to be stable. And when we bring in those electrons, and we say, hey, NAD, you need one more electron. I'm hydrogen. I've got, guess what? One electron. Let's, let's get together and share. You produce a molecule of NADH. Notice, NADH doesn't have a charge. NADH is simply carrying the electron. And it carries it in the form of that hydrogen atom. Can you see that? So these are going to transport what we largely call as our electrons, and we're going to put those and use the protons of hydrogen in our electron transport chain. Because both are going to be significant. Getting more detail, right? It's looking more complicated. So I wanted to start simple and then build on what we know. So without looking at the slide, what are the three products, the three net products of glycolysis. Notice I'm not asking you how many because we're making the same number of everything, right? We're making two of this, two of this, two of this. All you have to remember, two of everything and one of the three everythings. ATP, I heard ATP. NADH. NADH. Pyruvate. You're making two of See how easy that is? It's easy. Now when we get through the steps, of the process, we're going to break that down too. But again, we got two of everything, pyruvate, ATP, and ADH. So, rather than look at glycolysis as one box, now we're going to break it into three boxes. And overall, there are ten steps of glycolysis. So we're going to talk about the preparation and cleavage step, phase one. Oxidation and ATP production. And our last step is going to be pyruvate formation and ATP production. So here is, you know, the, the basic steps of our three. We take glucose and we're going to break this down. Notice what's happening here. What's happening in our preparation step? using energy. We're using energy and specifically using that energy but we're taking a phosphate off of each ATP molecule and sticking it onto these two three carbon molecules. So that's the cleavage part. We're breaking it down from a six into two three carbon molecules called two glyceraldehyde three phosphate. So that's phase one. Phase two the oxidation step is as we process our glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, there's two of them, that's what they're representing there. We're going to take electrons out and hydrogens and we're going to oxidize two NADH molecules. So there's our oxidation of production of two NADH. So we're going to have, each, we're going to have one of these produced per glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate because really that, that's our net. We produce 2 NADH through glycolysis, so that, that's all we're going to do there. But notice we're, we're putting in these phosphate groups, but boom, we're also going to be taking two out and we produce 2 ATP. So in our oxidation and ATP generation, we're producing 2 NADH, 2 ATP, and when we come out of this process, we have three phosphoglycerate now as our intermediates. So we broke them apart here, we're changing them here, we're covering some phosphates. And then our final formation of pyruvate, we're gonna take these three phosphoglycerates, we're gonna change them into pyruvate, liberating two more ATP.
So again, I've been looking at this big single box. Now we've got these three smaller boxes with some detail. Now let's look at each individual step. Let's start with phase one. Whoa, no structures. Now looking at the structures is going to help understand what's happening. And at each step here where you see Gly 1, Gly 2, Gly 3, Gly 4, Gly 5, those are the five steps as we go. And these are different enzymes that are listed here at the bottom. If you learn the names of the enzymes, that's going to help you understand the steps. Not essential for me. Okay, we're, we're gonna we're, we're gonna go through this. If you don't if you don't get it still after we get to the big detail of phase three, let me know. So here we're starting with glucose. And again, we see what's happening. Again, this is the overview. We're gonna use two molecules of ATP, and we're gonna cleave that six carbon into two glyceraldehyde three phosphate molecules. So here's our glucose. In the first reaction, we are taking one phosphate, adding it to the glucose, making glucose 6-phosphate. We go through the next step, we're changing glucose into fructose, we're changing shape. We haven't gotten rid of any carbon yet, we're still 6, six carbons. We're not getting, we're not going to produce any CO2 here, you're only going to produce CO2 in the third part. So we're sticking with our carbons. We take our fructose 6-phosphate, add a phosphate to it. Now we're going to have fructose that's got a phosphate on each end. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Then after we take our doubly phosphated fructose, it's going to go through enzymatic processing. This is an intermediate, the hydroxyacetone phosphate. But both, even if we end up with this one, it's going to be converted quickly into glyceraldehyde three phosphate, which is the end of phase one. All right? Is that, is that complicated enough? Yeah, let's simplify. Is that okay? Simplify. You're, you need to remember all those things, but that's not what you're going to memorize. We're going to bring around some cheat sheets. Here's my cheat sheet. What do we start with? Glucose. See, we're going to write all that. G, we know G's glucose. When we go from glucose to, what is this? What? What's the something? G, we are, no, 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 no. Glucose is still glucose. Yeah, G. So, yeah, something's glucose. Well, something's glucose. Okay. Yeah. But where does the phosphate come from? Right there. So you're using molecule of ATP. So now we're going from G6P, F6 something, 6 phosphate. What is the F? Can you believe you already know these intermediates? And we spent what, five minutes on it? Fructose. Now we're going to go from the F6P. Now, I, I sort of did this nomenclature different. F16, and I have a P on each end. This is fructose 1,6, they call it bisphosphate, biphosphate. You've got the two phosphates. That's why I put the P's on the outside to know they're on each end. But the F is still fructose. And then we go through the last step, and we got this high dihydroxyacetone phosphate thing. Yeah, but this is the important part. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Now, you might want to make it a different G so that you don't, don't confuse this G with a glucose. How, how could we change this G so it would, you know, it wouldn't be glucose? Make it lowercase. Huh? Make it lowercase. A lowercase G, would that work for glyceraldehyde? Okay. Or a GY or a GL, you know. Whatever significance you can help you understand that. So what's the take-home message of phase one? The two basic take-home messages. Per glucose, we broke it down into three carbon molecules, two of them. 
So we either have one six carbon or two three carbons. We still, we're still working with six carbons. We cleaved it, cut it in half. But we had to use something. We had to use two ATP. That's phase one. Easy peasy, right? This stuff's not hard. You can make it hard if you want to. I don't like to make stuff. I like to make it easy so that we can all get it. Phase two. Oxidation. What is being oxidized? What are we adding electrons to? NAD. So oxidation and ATP generation, that's pretty straightforward. We're going to make ATP and we're going to make NADHs. So here's our glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Here we can see our NADH being produced. Here we can see we're producing our ATP and we end up with three phosphoglycerates. Now, here's where you have to follow carefully. In this illustration, they're showing what happens per every single glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. So you have to keep in mind that it's doubled. It's always going to be doubled. <coughs> so phase two, we produce NADH and we produce ATP. How many NADHs are produced in phase two per glucose molecule? Because this is the only place you're producing and oxidizing NAD. In phase two, and you know the net outcome of glycolysis is two NADH. So it's phase two. Everything seems to travel in pairs. Because also in phase two, how many ATP are you producing? Two. Alright? Enough look at that simplified? Oh. Little case. Lowercase g, gl, gy, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Here we have our oxidation of NAD. Here's our end product, 3 phosphoglycerate, after we produce our ATP. Notice I've always got the ATP up here, so it's the arrows that you have to pay attention to. All right. Phase two. Easy, easy. Mm -hmm. Last one. Ooh, that looks busy, right? So there's our three phosphoglycerate, and we have two of them. Here we are going to finish the conversion of our three carbon phosphoglycerates into pyruvate, and in doing so, we are liberating water. I'm sorry, not water. Look at over here. We are producing ATP. We do have some water being produced here, but we're not worried about the water. We want to know where the energy goes and where the carbons go. So I mean, there's there's not really much happening. All we're doing is when we get down here to the very end, right before we produce our pyruvate, that's where we produce our new molecule of ATP. So three glyceraldehyde uh, phosphate, two phosphoglycerate, PEP. Phenol, I, I forget the part. Phosphoenol pyruvate. I think there was a phenol in there somewhere. And then we end up with our final product of glycolysis pyruvate. How many carbons does pyruvate have? Three. Three. How many of them are produced per glucose molecule? Mm -hmm. Two. How many NADH is produced per glucose molecule? Mm -hmm. How many ATP produced net Two. per gly per glucose? Two. Now, in glycolysis, the gross production, the overall production, how many pyruvate? Mm -hmm. Two. How many NADHs? Two. Two. How many ATP produce? Four. 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 Gross is four produced, but remember, we had to use two to get it started in phase one. So because we had to use two, our net drops to two. That's the only difference. Sure. In phase one of glycolysis, we have to use two ATP. 
to get those phosphates stuck on the glucose. Because we're going to end up with fructose one six bisphosphate. So we got to use two molecules of ATP to do that. During phase two, we produce two ATP. During phase three, we produce two more ATP. That's the gross production. But since we had to use two to start with, well, we only get to put two in the bank. Because we had to borrow two. We had to pay the bank. The person can't borrow money, they only expect you to pay it back. So we only get to take two home and get to play with two of them. That's the net. So the net is two? I'm sorry? The net is two of them. Net is two. Net's two of everything. Gross is two of everything as well as except for ATP. Gross for ATP is four. So again, it's pretty straightforward. And if you simplify it and break it down into those steps, hanging on to what you know the net versus gross overall production is, you know our three steps, preparation of cleavage, oxidation and ATP production, pyruvate formation and ATP production, and then our simplified little stick charts. You got it. I mean, that's, that's glycolysis. It's not that scary. It's really not. You can make it that way, but I don't want to. Now, what do we do with our pyruvate now? What are cells going to do with pyruvate? Now, we made our pyruvate. Where is pyruvate in the cell? Where will you find pyruvate? In the cytosol. That's where glycolysis happens. So pyruvate is still in the cytosol. So we need to get the energy of those bonds and we need to get our electrons out of the cytosol and into where? The mitochondria. The mitochondria is where we're going to see our energy production for the cell. And when we do that, that's going to be plugging pyruvate and all that energy into our aerobic respiration pathway. And so one of the things that we can do with our pyruvate is head down aerobic metabolism pathway. We can plug it into the TCA cycle, citric acid cycle, Krebs cycle, all synonyms for the same thing. In that process, we're going to break those three carbons of each pyruvate down into three CO2 molecules. We're going to get a lot more electrons and we're going to produce some more ATP at the substrate level. And then we're going to send that on to our electron transport chain, our ATP synthase, so our oxidative phosphorylation step, which the very end of that process, we've got to have oxygen. So if we have oxygen, we're going this way. If we don't have a sufficient supply of oxygen, we're going to go down an anaerobic pathway, which is called fermentation. Now, for us, fermentation is not as much fun as it is for people like the Jack Daniels Distillery and Coors and that kind of fermentation is different. When we're talking about yeast, we're talking about fermentation yielding alcohol. But in our bodies, when we go through fermentation, we produce lactate. And I don't think anyone would say that lactate is our friend. It's one of the things that makes you sore. When you work too hard, you wake up the next day, you're like, oh, lactate, I hate you. No, you've never said that. Lactic <laughs> acid. No, I say bench press, I hate you. Yeah, lactate. Now, here's, here's the reason that we undergo fermentation. You could say, well, why don't we just wait until there's oxygen around? Well, if you're running away from something that's trying to eat you, you don't want to stop and wait. You got to keep going, so you need to make some energy. And during this process of fermentation, we're not going to make a ton of energy, but we're going to make some. We're going to make some um, substrate level phosphorylation we got from glycolysis. How many ATP are we going to get from glycolysis that we can use? Two. Two. <coughs> Two's better than nothing. But if pyruvate just sat around, because we didn't have any oxygen and the mitochondria wasn't processing it. The pyruvate, as 
we build up more and more and more of our product, what is it going to do to the equilibrium of our reactions? As we have more and more product, our reactions are going to go more and more backwards. And it's going to slow that production down to even the two in glycolysis. So we've got to get rid of the pyruvate to keep glycolysis going and make even a little bit of energy. That's why we have to take pyruvate and we break it down into lactate. Again, here's bacteria and yeast that produces the ethanol. This is going to be our aerobic pathway, and we have this one little transition step that we'll learn about. But we get rid of pyruvate products. Uh, important in muscles. Yeah, it makes you sore. That's, that's how it's important in muscles. We are, we are much better suited for aerobic exercises. You have to maintain a level of, of activity such that the oxygen you're bringing in is sufficient to supply the muscles with the oxygen they need to continue to produce ATP while the muscles are burning ATP. Humans are built for jogging. Humans are built for endurance. Not necessarily speed. You know a prime example of that? Our ancestors, the hunter gatherers, do you know how they hunted and killed their prey? They ran them to death. Okay, I'm sorry, I don't care how hungry I may have been, I am not going to run down my food. It took a long time. They just, you know. Okay, here's a gazelle. You've seen those things in, in Africa? Okay, pretty fast, right? Well, here comes a little red blood cell, you know, with his spear. He's running. The gazelle sees and jumps up, takes off. But the gazelle sprints away, gets in this anaerobic state, and they have to stop. Well, the friend's still coming. He's still coming. Good. Man, got one quick. Gets up. And keep sprinting and sprinting and sprinting until finally the muscles are so full of lactate, animal can't run anymore. And so finally says, Look, just go ahead and kill me. I'm not running anymore. See, that'd be me. Like, not, I ain't running anymore, just kill me now. I wouldn't even stop running. I'm going to shoot me. I ain't running now. <laughs> shoot me now. But that was our ancestors because our bodies are built for aerobic exercise, aerobic. Um, what am I trying to say? Activities. So, uh, does, so lactate helps build muscle? No. No? No. Okay. Lactate interferes with the functioning of the muscle. Oh. And again, that's why you're sore. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, again, yeast do something completely different. Okay. They, they produce mm -hmm. the ethanol. So, again, as we look at what do we do with pyruvate, well, there's the ethanol for fermentation. There's the lactate for our pyruvate. We're going to send it off somewhere else so that we can use it in our aerobic pathway. So fermentation. Do we have any NADH produced? No, we actually use some. We don't, we don't produce any. But we still have our two molecules of ATP that were netted during glycolysis. We're not producing anymore. So when we have our two molecules of ATP, then we've converted our two pyruvate molecules that have three carbons into two lactate molecules that have, guess how many? Three carbons. Now, let's, let's look at our Look at our delta G naught prime for our lactate. When we look at those lactate molecules, 93% of all the energy we could obtain from glucose is still in the lactate. That means through fermentation, we've only recovered 7% to ATP. That sucks. If you had to pay 100% for something that you only have to use 7% of it, I don't think they would be in business very well. But 7% is better than 
And that's why you can do anaerobic activity for a short period of time. Because your body is much like me. I'll, I'll do that for a little while, but then I'm just going to say, ah, oh, forget it. I just quit. And if you're at that anaerobic level, if you're at your maximum that you can bring oxygen in to supply your muscles, you're not going to do that very long at all. Look at the difference between our sprinters at a track meet and our, you know, 5,000 meter runners. How long does a 100 meter dash take? Is it the same Bolt's record as under 10? Yes. Yeah. He's not going to run that speed for 5,000 meters. No. And at the end of that race, he's done. He's not going to turn around and do it again either. He's done. That's anaerobic. You can only do it for a short period of time. Now, we mentioned glucose. That was going to be our stereotypical starting molecule. But you can use other substrates, other materials to begin with. See, here's our glucose. So we can have other sugars that we plug in. Sucrose, maltose, lactose. Somebody give me a general... Uh, contrast. How, how are these different from glucose? What's a general characteristic of lactose, maltose, sucrose that makes them principally different from glucose? Hmm? Hey, hang on. Disaccharides. These disaccharides all have what? Glucose. So, you're, you're taking these molecules, breaking them apart. See, lactose is galactose and glucose. Sucrose is glucose and fructose. Maltose is just two glucose. So you split them apart, plug them in. But you can also, also take galactose with other enzymes, and then boom, you can convert the lactose into glucose 6-phosphate and plug it in at the first step. Fructose, look, you've got an enzyme that can take fructose, boop, snap a phosphate on it and plug it in here. Here's a mannose. We can process mannose and turn it into fructose. So you see there are a number of different ways you can plug materials in. It doesn't all have to start with the glucose. This is kind of cool over here. Glycerol. Our phospholipids that have a glycerol group, if you rescue some of that glycerol from membranes, you plug glycerol in right here, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, we're at the very end. So we, we just jump in right at the very end. So, so do you see how we can use a lot of different materials to supply some energy? Now, starch, glycogen, storage forms of glucose, starch for plants, glycogen for animals. We come in, we take our long chain of glucoses, we process them, and we pop off one molecule. Now typically when we do that, we're going to liberate a glucose that has a phosphate attached to it. What kind of reaction would that be from past chapters where we take a polymer and we liberate a monomer? Hydrolysis hydrolysis, lysis to break. So this is one of our examples in much finer detail of a hydrolysis reaction. See, we're still using stuff we learned generically in the first unit. We're still using it here, even though it's getting much more complicated. Glycolysis, glycolysis, sugar breaking. Gluconeogenesis. What in the world does that mean? Gluco sugar, glucose, neo, neogenesis, production, birth. So we're making new glucose. What are we going to make new glucose from? Let's start with pyruvate. And let's go backwards. Now, for glycolysis, what was the delta G for glycolysis? Negative. 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 Can you predict what the reverse 
gluconeogenesis, what would that delta G look like? Positive. You have to supply energy. There we have some ATP being used. We're also going to use some energy that's a part of GTP. And look, we're, we're snatching some of those electrons back. So you can go backward, but understand that not every enzymatic reaction for glycolysis is reversible. There are three unique enzymes that you have to have for gluconeogenesis to happen. All right? And so over here, we've got to add in those four ATP if we're going to go backward from pyruvate to glucose. But we're also going to have to use two GTP as we go through that process. No, no, this this is not inter this is just yeah, this is just separate. So in some cases, if you're not burning a lot of uh, uh, glucose or if you have a lot of pyruvate and you're not requiring that energy production, you say, hey, instead of just leaving this around and ferment and stuff, let's just send it back to glucose. Correct. Yep. That's why you have that. Because remember, was our gross production during glycolysis? Four. So you got that four more. So we saw seven of the enzymes were reversible, three not reversible. But what we also see is inhibition and activation of certain enzymes. For instance, let's look at um, let's look at pyruvate kinase. What do you think pyruvate kinase does? Kinase adds a phosphate. What do you think it adds a phosphate to? Pyruvate. I love that name. That that enzyme may have an EC number of three dot six dots. I like pyruvate kinase. It's easy. But notice an activator of pyruvate kinase is fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. How does that work? How would fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, what would that be considered when we're talking about pyruvate kinase? What kind of activator that we learn about with enzymes is binding in a different location other than the active site? I so all of these reds and greens are allosteric <laughs> regulators of our enzymes, some of which are actually what is being produced. Look, ATP is an inhibitor of phosphofructose kinase. The more ATP you're producing, it's like, oh, we're going to slow this down. Um, here we have this molecule, acetyl-CoA. That's going to be this intermediate transition step between glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. So here we've got acetyl-CoA. Yep, we're going to turn this sucker on, which is going to back it up because we've got enough of this. We don't need to send it on through to oxidative phosphorylation electron transport. We're going to send it back to storage. So do you see how everything balances? Everything you're doing is going to feed back either in a positive feedback or a negative feedback mechanism to keep this thing going, but not too fast and not too slow. Because energy is essential for what our body is doing.